So Kate, ha Kate Harrison of the City of Berkeley is presenting today on existing Berkeley's existing building electrification retrofit and just transition pilot program. Kate Harrison was elected to the Berkeley City Council in March of 2017 after a decades long career in the public sector focused on protecting the most vulnerable. In office, she has been a champion for the climate, most recently authorizing legislation phasing out natural gas in new buildings, establishing a climate equity fund to assist low-income residents with transitioning to a zero carbon future. Welcome, Kate. Yay, Kate. Thank you so much. And I'm still having difficulty sharing my screen. So if you give me just a minute, we're gonna try and, ah, I think we have cracked this. Hold on a second. I'll be with you in just Sorry. one minute. Um, right. Let's see. Can you see me? You can see the end. We can see the end slide, correct. See the end and I'm going to go back up here and then I'm gonna get us into full screen and then we're gonna go. Okay. Right. Um, hmm. One more difficulty, getting us getting rid of this stuff on the left, but I'm almost with you here. It's that little button on the bottom right of your screen. There's, um, if, if you know how to get to full screen, there's a, there's a place on the other right to the left of that, not that one, go a little bit further on the other side of the scale. The first button on the left of that scale, it Got looks it. like a little tripod. Are we there? No, not that one. <laughs> three, three buttons over, not that one, but one over, that's the one. All right, I'm now ready. Thank you very much, Sean. I am going to turn thank off you, my Kate. camera for myself. Um, I want to thank everyone for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak about something a little different than what you normally talk about in these conferences. And again, I'm now having more difficulty. Just give me one more second. We're almost there, folks, I promise. Hold on a minute. I'll be right back with you. I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just start speaking and I hope my slides will catch up with me. Okay. And if not, I can make these slides available to all of you uh, after the conference. So um, this is a talk about the journey to building electrification and a just transition, or as I like to call it, persistence in the face of bureaucratic resistance. It's been more than two years since Berkeley passed the natural gas ban and Chris Nasso, my chief of staff, who I see calling me trying to explain how to do the slides, presented at the 2019 Redwood Energy Conference. I was originally scheduled to speak, but couldn't come. Fortunately, Chris took beautiful pictures of the beachside views from the conference in Arcata. Um, and I will really wish we could see more of you in person. I, my staff, and the city of Berkeley are so grateful for having met Sean Armstrong and the entire California building decarbonization community. I can't tell you how important it is as an elected official to have a passion, to have passionate experts, volunteers, and activists to support you at every step of the legislative process. Our success would not have been possible without you. Since the, we passed our gas ban, there's been a flurry of nationwide building decarb activity, as you know. And if you saw my screen, what you would be seeing, hold on, I think, I think we may be able to do it now. You're gonna get it in split, but that's just the way it goes, okay? We're gonna live with it being split because this way you get to see at least some of the materials. Yeah, no, this There's is a cool. flurry of nationwide building decarbonization activity since we passed the gas ban. Um, and this is an testament to the enduring strength of this movement. We wrote and passed the gas ban with the hope of influencing other local and state actors, but we never anticipated it would spread this quickly. We also, at the same time, have been working on decarbonization despite the COVID emergency. We are now at the point of looking at where do we go next with existing our existing housing stock. Last year, our Office of Energy and Sustainable Development prepared an existing buildings electrification strategy with report with RMI, the Berkeley Ecology Center, and the Berkeley um, Building Decarb Coalition. What we found out there's three big impediments to us decarbonizing our existing stock. First of all, we have about 50,000 buildings in Berkeley, of which 34,000 roughly are residential. And of those, 61% are single family homes. More importantly, 33% of the entire square footage in these homes, in these uh, residential buildings, are in single family homes. That demonstrates how disparate decision making about the building stock is and just how hard a challenge decarbonizing our existing stock is. We also have a second challenge, which is the aging building stock. Our buildings are incredibly old in Berkeley, and I think this is true in most inner cities. We have very old building stock pre-energy code, 
requiring major electrical update grades, even assuming a lack of 120 volt appliances coming online to us, and the need for intensive weatherization in our very, very old buildings. And finally, gas, and this is true statewide, dominates all appliances except clothes dryers. We simply do not have a large uptake with, with electric appliances except for clothes dryers, as I mentioned. And the number of stoves that we have are all resistance coils, cooktops, primarily, instead of induction. We basically have our work cut out for us. The preliminary estimates of what it would take to make this a reality in Berkeley are pretty much astounding. We have, we can see here that these estimates from our staff and consultants, and you're all experts here and may have even better estimates than these, but looking in column five, we can see that the city's consultant reported incremental costs above a gas alternative with current incentives at 7,900 to 12,000 just for the appliances themselves. If we're to add in the other aspects of improving the building envelope and looking at solar, the costs go even higher. The total cost to electrify Berkeley's low rise buildings for the city is an astounding number. It's between $880 million if we consider just mid-rise, mid-tier appliances rather, all the way up to $1.4 billion if we assume solar and envelope improvements. We know that also in addition to this challenge is the challenge of the absence of incentives for lower cost appliances. When we look down the scale at lower cost appliances, the incentive systems simply aren't there. Um, we need government subsidies in essence for low income residents, the market is not gonna solve this. We've, we basically have now looked at several different attempts to try to tackle our existing building stock. In 2018, I authored legislation expanding the existing seismic transfer tax rebate program in which new property owners can use part of their transfer tax to make seismic improvements to try to include electrification and other resiliency measures. This was delayed by the COVID-19. Uh, using that, we can see there are about eight to 900 residential units a year transferred, which generates about $4.6 million, which should be used to make these improvements in these buildings. As I said, that was delayed due to COVID. We also tried to put together a ballot measure for an increase in the utility users tax on better off customers and a removal of the tax altogether for low income customers using the two to $4 million brought in each year for equitable climate mitigation. This would have allowed for building decarbonization for low income individuals. That failed at the ballot. And I wanna say that we, we don't know exactly why we did a somewhat unscientific poll. And there were a few themes that came out from that. One, people just didn't know what decarbonization was. They don't know what electrification is. They don't know what a heat pump is. And they certainly don't know why it's important. Some voters, those better off, uh, were unhappy with the priority for low-income residents, unfortunately. And some lower-income residents, but those above the level that would have had their utility tax eliminated, were hesitant to increase their utility bills during a global pandemic. We didn't make the case adequately for the benefits of doing this. But nonetheless, despite the failure of these two efforts, the concept of prioritizing public subsidies for low-income and marginalized communities continues to have power following the pandemic and amidst ongoing conversations about equity, public safety, and in income inequality. So what we did next, we licked our wounds and we decided to create the Pilot Climate Equity Action Fund. This $600,000 fund, not a great deal of money admittedly, was an attempt to set aside funding for those households that are in less than 50% of the area median income. And basically the fund was divided into three categories, the resilient home retrofit project, the electric mobility access point project, and the community engagement project. Although $600,000 is not a lot of money, it provides staff an opportunity to do several important things. One, consider which approaches have the most climate impact and are the most cost effective. Two, to build relationships with the community and explain electrification and its importance. Three, improve people's lives materially. And four, learn and prepare for future influxes of funding. This fund is now the RFP has gone out and people are applying for these projects. Amongst the items in the building home retrofit pilot, 
were those that were allowing weatherization, air sealing subsidies um, to be combined with our funding to provide all electric appliances and also to do uh, panel upgrades, et cetera. The community access to resilience and engagement pilot had a number of smaller items, very important to people's health and comfort uh, in terms of providing air filters, um, induction cooktop, cooktop hubs, portable batteries. And it also allowed our community to have outreach, education, community engagement to identify what their priorities would be, again, for when we have more money. Enter the American Rescue Plan of March 2021. I cannot thank the president and the vice president enough for their work here. ARPA is a game changer for all cities and all people in the United States. We received a $66 million bailout for COVID-related budget losses. The law explicitly encourages cities to invest funds equitably and in ways that make communities more resilient. Meanwhile, scientists have warned that nations must spend much of their recovery funds on climate mitigation. We comb through this law. It does provide the flexibility we need to spend on climate mitigation, and it can be used for COVID recovery efforts. Obviously, our city manager and some of my colleagues were not too thrilled with this interpretation and would rather have spent this money on ongoing city operations. Uh, but there is funding available here, and we are continuing to push to use part of this funding for the all important work of electrifying our building stock. I have, though, kind of given up when labor stepped in. The California Workforce Development Board pr provided an $8.9 million grant for workforce development, and our own Bay Area Rising Sun Center for Opportunity received $600,000 for this grant, where, under which they were able to convene cities, other agencies, unions, and employers to talk about how to provide equitable access to high road jobs in the building decarbonization effort. This work was important, again, on a community building level, but it did not provide any actual funding for doing the work. Um, I, at this point, having had two pretty significant failures in the preceding year, thought that our transfer tax initiative was dead, but you should never say never. A representative from the Building and Construction Trades Council of Alameda County contacted me out of the blue encouraging me to look at this item again with a more developed labor workforce component. It turned out that as part of its statewide recovery efforts, the California Workforce Development Board had developed this grant, this $8.9 million grant, and people were meeting and talking about how do we engage labor in the electrification revolution. This grant organization provided feedback to our city on its existing building strategy specifically around labor standards and support for apprenticeships. This is a political goldmine for us. It provided a roadmap for a partnership with labor towards enhancing the previously dormant program through a shared set of priorities between green and blue. As many of you already know, the relationship between environmentalists and the building trades has a long and rocky relationship, one of mutual mistrust and misunderstanding. This is vividly playing out right now across the fight for about rooftop solar. Overcoming these hurdles is a key to meeting our climate goals. We also received support from our local union, SEIU 1021, who represents the workers who would administer such a program at the city level. So we then turn to revisiting our transfer tax concept. Um, at this point, I, we decided to change the concept a bit no longer relying simply on when properties were transferred, but also, which would still be included, but also looking at when appliances break in people's homes. We um, can see the day that your heater breaks in the middle of winter is not the day you're gonna consider whether you want a heat pump or not. We need to prepare existing homeowners who may not be transferring their property for making these changes. So we wanted to provide incentives for that. And we also finally, as I said before, provided a nexus for good paying jobs with prevailing wages, workforce development programs, and local hire requirements. Some of the money would, it be, would be used for zero carbon plumbing, HVAC, cooking, and related electrical systems. We added a preference for affordable housing buildings and households at or below 120% of area meeting income. This is a triple win. It's a win for labor, it's a win for low-income households, and it's clearly a win for the planet. Um, this is somewhat inspired by the um, 
uh, work that was, has gone on at SMUD and Electrify Marin, where they do give larger rebates to lower income households. But we uniquely added this emphasis on unionized contractors and workforce development. Unfortunately, again, this was delayed due to COVID. Some of the reasons to work directly with labor beyond the fact that it's beneficial to our low income communities is because it is, are the advantages of direct install. We're finding that working directly at the mid part of the market is much more effective than working with individual property owners. It eliminates the need for households to find and manage their own contractors. It eliminates or reduces the amount of money needed upfront by property owners to conduct retrofits or to wait for rebates at tax time. SMUD recently reported to CEC that their direct install program achieved significant cost savings of $1,600, for example, per water heater. And these savings may even be even greater if the direct install contractor is able to go door to door and convert multiple adjacent homes. It's also cost competitive at scale despite increased labor costs. We need a statewide just transition for gas utility and extraction workers. We know that there will be a loss of almost 4,000 jobs as a result of construction electrification. We also know, of course, the good news is that there'll be an addition of many, many more times jobs for building electrification. But in the meantime, those people have nowhere to go that have been working in the gas industry. So addressing the needs of gas workers is also a critical part of the work we've been doing. In our item, we included a resolution and letters to the CPUC, the CEC, Governor Newsom, State Senator Skinner, and our Assembly Member Wicks, calling for a statewide approach to rapidly contract the gas system in a way that is safe, economical for remaining customers, and provides a just transition for effective workers. While crafting this item, we were also approached by IBEW, who are the gas worker representatives, and they are now not opposing the program because of our addition of, of these, these points in the item. So I'm still hopeful. Our, the mayor has put forward the funding for this program as the first priority for our next two-year budget process. Whether that will stay, I don't know. We have a lot of competition for ongoing city services, a large push for increased police funding in our city, and a, a, just a general idea that people still don't quite understand what is this animal we call electrification. I'm hoping to encourage my colleagues to go ahead with this, to take advantage of the fact that the Tech Clean California Initiative has now provided $200 million statewide for these kinds of programs. We can leverage this money as well as the money from Bayran and EDCE. Why would we give up the power of taking advantage of this state and, local, and regional money? Local government is basically not alone in this fight. We are, however, the level of government closest to the people. Our dollars, our outreach, and our sensitivity to local communities are critical in solving the climate crisis. We can do this. Thank you for your attention. Woo! Stop sharing now. You didn't give up and things got better. Yeah. Because people chipped <laughs> Not in. better, but they kept going. <laughs> kept on going. Well. Um, let's see here. So people are saying thank you and great presentation and awesome work and all those nice things here. But then you also had some questions. Okay. Um, so Aaron McDade wanted to know where did the $600,000 to start the pilot project came, come from? And I think that was to Rising Sun and Roxana presented earlier today from Rising Sun, just so you know. Yeah. Well, there's two $600,000, which makes everything a little confusing. The Rising Sun program it came from this workforce initiative, and I don't know the original source of that funding. Our $600,000 is to start these small projects with low-income homeowners, and there's also a transit piece for uh, ride sharing, et cetera. Um, but it is, came from our general fund, essentially, in the city. So we were able to get some funding committed after the failure of the ballot initiative. Starting from, even yeah. from small amounts, at least build up. I, I, okay, so you know your big swing didn't make it the first time, but you're back at bat. Okay, so then uh, Nick says, you know, we owe Berkeley so much. Yes, we do. We, uh, Leslie wants to say, so appreciative of your leadership, Kate. Tom, power to the people. Thanks for the inspiring examples. Aaron's like, got it. Thanks. <laughs> okay, let's see. <laughs> um, let's see. Then Mark Stout commented that ESG is driving sustainability at corporate America. And this is affecting 
multifamily without public subsidies. Do you have any thought on, on that comment? I don't know what ESG is. I didn't either, I apologize. Yeah, um, I would just say that, yes, we have issues. That's why we're firmly focused on affordable housing developers, as well as we have two organizations in Berkeley. Uh, you've heard of Habitat for Humanity, but we also have a local version of that that work with low-income homeowners. And I should have said this, another powerful part of this is working through single organizations to tackle a number of units at once rather than even, even with contractors getting the mid-market incentives and marketing this, we need to have an organization that can identify these lower income residents and work with them efficiently. So using existing organizations like Habitat for Humanity for homeowners and like affordable housing developers is gonna really help us get the word out and get the money out. And um, are you af affiliated with, like Becky Menton earlier presented on the Block Power um, recent relationship right, to try to project manage and help finance uh, the retrofits of people's homes. It, have, have you gotten involved in e, East Bay Community Energy's work there? I'm, I'm on the board of East Bay Community Energy and we just last week voted to uh -huh. work with Black Power. Um, I suspect that most of the work will be outside of Berkeley. Mm. Berkeley has a quite a large number of low-income people, but we do not have low-income census tracts. Mm -hmm. And typically what happens, we get denied a lot of support for our disparately uh, living low-income households. Right. They don't They're live in rivers. one area. So we tend not to have a single neighborhood that's considered a low-income tract. And that oh, so is you, have, you have no ghettos and therefore you don't get help with the people that's who are disadvantaged. Right. Oh, really? So when you do the right thing, they take the money away. <laughs> that's right. When, when we have integration, we lose out financially. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, one of the questions was, uh, were there any federal funds? And I think to amend that, the federal funds that you got, the 66 million, right? And, and has, that's not being deployed. I heard you saying that you're, 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 the staff are struggling and planning. Yes, what's happened is we had a certain amount of that money that we have spent to make up revenue losses the city suffered from loss of sales tax, parking revenues, hotel tax, you know, everything fell apart for like a year. Um, but we still have money available. We still have the other half of the money. Um, the city administration tends to look at it as like, let's just put back what we had before COVID. And we look at it as build back better, mm -hmm. really. I think we're saying, let's not just do what we always did. Um, it may, we have a lot of vacancies in the city. Those positions aren't gonna get filled right now. This is a time to do something innovative with the money we're saving from, from having vacancies, frankly. Um, and also this money is tied specifically in the federal um, ARPA language to equity mm -hmm. and to resiliency. So we're making the case that some of this money has to go to this. And do you have other cities that are examples or in a coalition? Because this is a national you know, a policy. Are there other cities that are, who are taking a swing at, at using that equity language to distribute the money? Um, I think that they are using the language for equity, but I haven't heard anyone else using it for climate. Oh, really? Hmm. Okay, that's interesting. Um, well, all the 109 participants here, I hope that any of you guys can put in the chat here, do you know of other cities, big or small, that are, are pairing equity and climate? Well, certainly some, some of the CCAs are doing that uh -huh. um, because like I said, uh, SMUD uh -huh. and uh, I think it's Mar Electrify Marin, they give more funding in rebates to low-income customers. But I'm thinking with the federal funds that all the cities got. Is yeah, I do not know if anyone else has done this or is looking to do this. And, and But the language is there, you're saying supporting both climate yes. and equity. Yes, yes. Well, I thank you for leading the way. <laughs> Welcome. I, I saw someone had a question about community colleges and I did want to just address that really briefly. Mm -hmm. I think that is part of the, the secret sauce of making this work, which is why our apprenticeship programs are so important. We're pushing our unions hard to hire locally from Berkeley. Um, you know, again, people tend to be hired from outside of the area because it's cheaper to live other places, but we do have low income people here and we have a lot of community college students who would love to go into this field. So I think this is a really big opportunity for them to stretch. Mm. The question here about when enacting a utility users tax, is it congruent with Prop 218 to, fend, to spend funds only on a portion of the community, i.e. low-income people? 
it was a, it was a ballot measure, so you were allowed to do that. Two eighteen uh, funds are collected through in a different way. So yes, you can do that through a ballot measure. Um, I should have said one of the other flaws of our UUT is that PG&E would not give us the separated data for mm. utility, for gas and electricity. So we were forced to try to apply this tax on all utilities, which is so counterintuitive to wanting to electrify. But we decided to go ahead and try because wow. we're not gonna get that data from them. They wanna charge us a million dollars, I think it is, to do this data analysis. Mm -hmm. Which they must know the answer, right? I mean, they, they send me a bill. <laughs> they get paid literally two billion dollars to put in smart meters and everyone's meters, huh? They're going to charge you a million dollars to give us the data that they charge us two point billion dollars. <laughs> oh, really? Yes. Really? Then we're going to help you out. Um, I remember when we in Arcata implemented a our, my partner Michael um, as a city council member got a tax on six times the first tier. So if you were six X of, of the first tier consumption, essentially meant your entire house is indoor weed cultivation. And 11% mm -hmm. of Arcata turned into just houses that were exclusively growing cannabis inside, no people, 11% mm -hmm. of our housing stock. So this tax was, uh, PG&E heavily opposed us trying to implement the tax. And then they gave us a, a budget of like, it's gonna be $600,000. And then at the end of the day, it was like 120. Like it was mm -hmm. like an order of magnitude less than what they were threatening it was going to be. Yeah, mm -hmm. I remember that it wasn't long ago, yeah. but it really worked. It went from 11% to 1% once we got our tax in place. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. So um, I, I would be really interested if uh, I'm happy to answer all the questions, but also at the end, mm -hmm. if you could send me all the chat questions, because these are the things we need to be thinking about as we're working through our legislation. I w absolutely will. Um, for the folks, I'm going to type in here, if you'd like to get um, the chat comments, admin at redwoodenergy.net. If you can write there, that's where we're going to, like, we don't want the chat to just go out to everybody and become potentially useful for fossil fuel folks. There might be one of those people on this for all I know, and that's fine. You know, everyone's welcome to learn. Um, but I, we're also just trying to keep things somewhat internal. Similarly for the slide decks. Um, we're going to try to collect everyone's slide decks. We didn't get a chance to get most people's slide decks, but that's also going to be, but all the presentations themselves are going to go on YouTube. So everyone gets to watch, um, but the chat isn't in that. So, yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Right. Yay, Kate. Well, thank you very much. Hey. I was really, really, really want to see everybody in person. I'm hoping <sighs> this is the last year we have to do this this way. <laughs> I've got this already planned this summer for like the uh, Lost Whale Inn up here, which has got a gorgeous ocean view and I can do tents for outside COVID. Um, and the there's a private entrance down to the beach and I'll have the massage therapist there and all the free childcare and all the organic food from our local farms. And I'm gonna like bring it back in style. Um, we used to have to do that because no one would come to the, any party that it was all electric. And so I was like, I'm going to throw a party that at least I'm going to be able to handle because I've got little kids and I'm a former former massage therapist and I'm going to have like live music because I like music and mm -hmm. <laughs> if, things, if no one else is going to throw this party, we will. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. And you actually, I should tell everybody here that you were actually the inspiration for all this. We saw a presentation by Sean at um, the Ed Roberts campus in Berkeley about building electrification and that's really what started this whole thing. So Really, our success is your success. Thank I you. think that the, the Berkeley activists take credit. You know, like it's nice to be a carrier of information. I love it. Um, as like a former theater kid and such. Oh, I'm having so much fun. But uh, that it was amazing to me when you guys had the electrification expo that that people just poured out and filled the room. There was hundreds of people and like it was hot in the room and they stayed for hours <laughs> mm -hmm. asking questions. Like Berkeley is awesome, and you guys did as a community do this work. And you continue to to the degree that you succeed. Like it's because you you continue to bring lots of voices in. So good on you. Shana Thank you very much. Good to see everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Bye.